Hi, I'm Mark Spagnolo, host of The Wood Whisperer at thewoodwhisperer.com. And today, we're going to try and find a compromise in that great debate between hand tools and power tools. You know, a lot of woodworkers on a daily basis go through that struggle trying to figure out what should I use, a hand tool or a power tool. Well, time to smooth out my glue up. I could use the drum sander. That'd be fast and easy. I could also use my cabinet scraper. Hmm. Hey, psst. Look, man. You know you want to use me. Why are you going to waste your time with that stupid hunk of steel? This is woodworking for Norm's sake. Why would you even want to break a sweat? Just plug me in so we can get back to watching those woodworks reruns. Excuse me. Don't listen to him. He's just jealous. I mean, look at me. I'm practically an antique and I'm still shiny and sharp. Not bad for $10 on eBay. Don't make me come over there. I'll sand that bevel right out of your iron. Psst, I'll rip that paper All right, right enough. off your face. Let's compromise. Let's use both. You know, one of my first victorious moments in woodworking was when I finally learned how to glue up a panel. Uh, the problem was that was soon to be followed by my first attempt at flattening a panel, which was a little less than glorious. Uh, I think the first thing I did was take a, a belt sander to it, and uh, I think you know what happens when you lean a little bit too much to one side or the other with a belt sander. It's an unruly machine, and I don't recommend using it. Uh, it takes a lot of experience to, um, to wrangle one of those to work for you. What I prefer to do with a flat panel, something like this, to clean up all those little joints, the glue, anything that might be uneven and flatten everything out, is a number 80 cabinet scraper. Uh, the best thing about these is that they're cheap. You can find these on eBay, you can get them used anywhere, and even brand new, they're not very expensive. I think they're like 30 bucks. So the idea here is you've got a blade that's held in at a, well, it's a little higher than 45, maybe 70 degrees, something like that. It's, it's at a pretty steep angle, so it's a scraping action. Uh, there's a 45 degree bevel on the blade and a burnished hook, okay? So the idea, you support the, the piece with your thumbs. It's very, I mean, for a big piece of uh, metal like this, it's really comfortable. And what I like to do is go across the joints at about a 45 degree angle, similar to what you might do with a hand plane if you were cleaning it up that way. Okay, now you can have these tuned to be either uh, really aggressive or, you know, sort of take fine little shavings. And there's a little thumb screw back here that you can use to make that adjustment. Okay, so you just slowly, and you, you'll feel at one point the high points will catch. So as you can see, that's a pretty aggressive cut. I mean, look at these uh, shavings here. They're really something you might expect to see from a hand plan. Now, these things are great. Because they're inexpensive, you can get more than one. And what I like to do is have one set up for really fine cuts, so you could do sort of your final smoothing, and one set up for more aggressive cuts. And they're just like card scrapers, where uh, the way that you burnish that hook determines how aggressive the cut is going to be. Now, as an alternative, of course, you could use the belt sander, like I mentioned before, but that requires a lot of experience and control, and I, I don't really recommend it. Uh, of course, if you have a wide belt sander, you can use that, uh, but most of us don't. So something like this is an inexpensive solution, and, uh, you know, so you lose a few pounds while you're doing it. It's good exercise, uh, but really, you move quickly, doesn't cost you very much money, and it levels the surface perfectly. All right, so now let's take a look at dados and grooves. It's one of the most common joints that you're going to come across, especially if you do a lot of case work. Uh, my favorite way to cut these is on the table saw using a dado stack. But there are a couple problems when you do that. First of all, uh, the bottom groove itself could have all these little lines in it, depending on your dado stack. Uh, it usually isn't until you get to the really expensive sets that you get a perfectly clean bottom. And even then, sometimes it still may not be perfect. So, uh, you want to have that as flat and clean as possible so that the adjoining piece that comes in has a really good bonding uh, surface. The other thing, and this is even more of a problem, think about when you put a big sheet of plywood over the table saw and you're running a dado down a cabinet side or a bookcase side, let's say. Um, what, what winds up happening is this piece of plywood is not always dead flat. It may move up a little bit, the blade may push it up a little bit, you may not get even registration all the way across the, the entire cut. So you could take an adjustable square and run it all the way down and you'll notice at some points this square rises up and comes back down and up and down. So you want to even all of that out. And uh, I find that the easiest way to do that is to use a router plane. It's a great tool for this. Okay, and I purposely, this is a very short board so it was pretty 
uh, pretty right on, but I purposely made it so that this end is a little bit more shallow and needs to be worked so that I can give you a, a nice example of what, what I'm talking about here. So let me get this in the clamp. What I have set here is a uh, Veritas rounder plane. It's got the half inch blade in there. What I like to do is set the blade depth so that it's at the point that I want it to be. You just take a measurement and say, okay, this, this end is perfect. It's exactly a quarter inch deep. You set it there, tighten everything down so it doesn't move on you. And then it's really, I mean, this doesn't get any easier than this. You just push forward until it makes a connection. Okay, so you can see it's already starting to come up. Now I'm using MDF core ply here, so this is, this is like butter, but it gives you a really good example of what I'm talking about. And because that blade is set at a fixed depth, it gives you the perfect depth consistently all the way across. So here's the mortise and tendon joint, probably one of the most fundamental joints that you could learn in woodworking. Now I like to cut mine, again, on the table saw using the dado stack, which leaves me with a lot of ridges that need to be cleaned up. What I recommend doing is sneaking up on the cut, getting as close as you can, uh, kind of like Price is right, as close as you can without going over. And you know you want to you want to stop at the point that it's it's pretty clear that you're it's too big for the uh, for the mortise, and that's fine because what we're going to do is use some hand tools to fine tune it. Now one of my favorite ways to clean up a tendon like this is the shoulder plane. Now if you have a rabbiting block plane, okay, a regular block plane you see has a space here between the side of the uh, the body and the blade itself. Okay, that's not going to work because we need to get right up against. Uh, the shoulder here. So if you do use this, you're probably going to need to come back with a chisel and clean up that inside edge. But with a uh, shoulder plane, you can go right up to the shoulder, okay, and take that pass. You clean up most of it in one shot, but it does take a second pass to get that other side. So just a few quick passes here. We'll clean it up and give us that fit that we're looking for. Okay, now keep in mind, you can also clean up the side of the tenon using a chisel. Okay, just a few swipes here and there. We'll remove just the right amount of material. And eventually, your patience is rewarded with a nice, tight fit. Now, when you need to trim something flush to the surface, there's really no better tool than the flush trim saw. It's a very flexible blade that doesn't have any set so that you can actually put it down on the surface, rub it back and forth, and it really doesn't damage the surface. And with this very thin blade like this, we can do things like trim plugs and dowels flush to the surface, and all they need is a little bit of a scraping or a light sanding to get them ready for a finish. In this example, I have a uh, pinned tenon, essentially. It's much bigger, and uh, this is quick and dirty work here, so I didn't pay much attention, but it's uh, in place there and it's secure. So now what I want to do is trim that flush to the surface. Okay, so what I like to do is use one finger to hold it down on the surface, because to hold the handle, I need to lift up a little bit. Uh, so I want to make sure that's nice and flush to the surface. And just slowly make some passes back and forth. What you'll be left with You got a nice trimmed plug there. Now cutting mortises for hinges can be pretty tricky if you don't really have a good system for doing it. And what I like to do is this combination of hand tools and power tools. First thing is I take the hinge and I use the hinge itself as a template. And I trace around the hinge using a nice sharp X-Acto knife. Once the trace lines are there, I just take a pencil and I draw in, and this gives me a visual reference. It's a lot easier to see than the, uh, just the line from the X-Acto knife. So then I take my router, and I use the, the hinge itself as the gauge for how deep to go. And I set the plunge bar so that it's exactly the thickness of my hinge. And once that's done, all I need to do is plunge and route as much material as I can. And I make a point to stay away from the line itself. Now the reason I do that is the router gives me a nice, clean, consistent bottom that's uh, an even depth all the way across, and that's a great reference 
for using your hand tools. Okay, but I don't, because it's a rounded bit, it's a little clunky, I can't really get into the, uh, the finer points of, uh, of that mortise, and that's where the chisels really shine. Um, so let's go ahead and start cleaning this up. So I take my narrower chisel, and I basically use my scribe line as a guide. It tells me exactly where to place that chisel. Quick tap. Okay, and now we can do the other side. See, now you want to do the outside edges first because we want to sever the fibers. The fibers are going this way. Okay, so if we start going on the back end here, we can easily split right across. But by doing the side pieces first, we sever the fibers ahead of time so that when we use the big guy here and we go across the back, there's no splitting. Okay, so now that we've established our border, I'm just going to chip away a little bit inside of my line. So that it basically comes off in smaller pieces. Cross grain each time. Okay, now to get this back edge, I want to slip the chisel underneath a little bit like so while registering off of the uh, part of the mortise that we know is dead flat. And that just loosens that back piece up a little. It should pop right out. Okay, so now I just do a little paring action, make sure I clean everything up <sighs> nice and evenly. And what you should be left with is a very nice hinge, mortised perfectly. Hopefully by now you see that this doesn't have to be an either or proposition. Both hand tools and power tools play crucial roles in your woodworking. And honestly, I feel that the hybrid approach is really the most efficient and the best way to go. Not to mention, that ain't there just for looks. Thanks for watching.